Hi there, everybody. Welcome to our vodcast on the motion and the phases of the moon. In this vodcast, what we'll talk about is the rotation and revolution of the moon around the Earth, how the different phases of the moon are caused throughout the month and the lunar cycle, and then lastly, the role the moon plays in solar and lunar eclipses. So let's start really quickly by just briefly touching on how the moon formed in the first place. Now, in this picture, as you could see, uh, the popular theory among scientists on how the moon formed was this. You had a small rocky body called a planetesimal, which is basically a smaller version of a planet. And as the solar system was forming and the Earth was in its early stages, a planetesimal collided with the Earth. And this collision was so violent, as you can see, a lot of the Earth's material, rocky material, got ejected into space. So this material, according to scientists, was the material that the moon would be formed out of. Now, how did that happen? Well, what happens is this. You have that planetesimal, and this planet here, let's say, represents Earth. When that planetesimal collides into Earth, as we saw before, that material from Earth gets ejected into outer space. But the Earth has a gravitational pull. So since that material can't move fast enough to escape Earth's gravitational pull, it gets caught in the pull and then gets swirled and spun around the Earth, just like the Earth gets spun around the Sun. And as this material swirls and moves around the Earth, all that dust and rock is going to collide with one another at high speeds, basically clumping together, and eventually it's going to form the Moon. So that's how the Moon came to be around the Earth. So let's talk about its motions. Now the motions that we're going to talk about is rotation, how long it takes for the moon to complete one spin, and its revolution, how long it takes for the moon to move around the earth. Now when we discuss the period of rotation and revolution, there's a few different ways you can give the amount of time. First of all, we have what's called sidereal time. Sidereal time is the real time it takes the moon to finish one revolution, so the actual amount of days for it to happen. You can always remember that by the word real at the word of sidereal. And then you have lunar time. Lunar time is basically the time it takes to go from one new moon to the next in the lunar cycle. So you can always remember luna means moon and basically try to remember new moon to new moon. That's how I remembered it. And there's going to be a third one that we have called calendar time, which I'll get, get to in a little bit. So period of rotation. In sidereal time, it takes the moon 27.3 days. So that's the actual time it takes for the moon to complete one spin. In lunar time, as we talk about from new moon to new moon, the lunar time is going to be 29.5 days. And then as a result, our calendar time, when we talked about the period of rotation for the Earth, we said 24 hours is equal to one day. The period of revolution of the Earth around the sun was 365 and a quarter days or one year. The calendar time for the moon, as you can see, is roughly about 30 days, which we basically roughly estimate as a month. So the period of rotation of the moon is about one month. And now let's take a look at the period of revolution. The period of revolution, or the time it takes for the moon to move around the Earth, for sidereal time is also going to be 27.3 days, and the lunar time is going to be 29.5 days. And as a result, your period of revolution basically says it takes the moon about a month to move around the Earth. So if you take a look at your sidereal times, they're the same for rotation and revolution. Your lunar times, they are the same for rotation and revolution. And then your calendar times are the same for rotation and revolution. So this tells us that the rotation is equal to its revolution. And we're able to figure that out because if you notice, whenever you see a full moon, you always see the same side of it. You never see a different part or different side of the moon. And the reason being is this. If you pay attention to the flag here on the moon, as you notice, as the moon revolves around the Earth, the moon will also spin. So instead of having the flag pointing this way to the left like it was here, that rotation points the flag back towards the Earth. And as the moon continues to revolve around the Earth, that rotation continues to point that flag back at the Earth. And as the moon continues to move around, that flag is still pointed back at the Earth. And when we finally get to the completion of its revolution, that flag is back to its original starting point. So what we see here is that the moon takes the same amount of time to rotate or spin as it takes to get around the Earth. Now let's take a look at what it would look like if the moon didn't 
rotate as it revolved around the Earth. So here we have the Earth again, and here we have our moon with the flag. So imagine you're, you're an observer on the Earth taking a look at the moon in space. As the moon goes through its motions, you'll notice that the flag at this point will be pointing towards the Earth. Since we're not going to rotate the moon, that flag will no longer be pointing towards the Earth. And then at this point, we will no longer see the flag anymore because it's on the opposite side of the moon. If the moon rotated back towards the Earth, then we would see it, but it's not rotating here in this example. So as we continue to move the moon around the Earth, we start to see the flag again, and then eventually it gets pointed back to us. So this is without the rotation of the moon around the Earth. And being that that flag will always appear to be pointing at us in this motion here, that helps back up the idea that the rotation is the same speed as the revolution. So let's talk about the different phases of the moon. Now the different phases of the moon are basically the different shapes or appearances the moon takes throughout the month. So if you look down here, these are the different appearances that the moon will look like as the month progresses with each passing day. Now the reason why we have moon phases is because of two things. One, the moon phases are caused by the reflection of the sun's light off the moon's surface. The moon doesn't generate its own light. So when you see parts of the moon, this is the amount of sunlight being reflected by the moon. And as you can see, it increases as the month goes on, eventually then starting to decrease the amount of sunlight as the month progresses towards the end. So first of all, we see the different phases because of the different amounts of light being reflected by the sun. Second of all, we see the phases because the moon's position around the Earth changes when it revolves. If we take a look here, you'll notice that the amount of sunlight changes because the moon is actually changing its position around the Earth. Now, there's two words that you have to be familiar with. You have to be familiar with waxing and you have to be familiar with waning. Waxing simply means it's the increase of light on the moon. So here on the left, this would be a new moon, which is basically you see no moon in the sky, but as the light starts to increase, it's starting to wax. So these pictures here show a waxing of light on the moon. And then we have the opposite, which is called waning. Waning is the decrease of light on the moon. So once you get past your full moon, where you see all the moon lit up, eventually what's going to happen is that light is going to decrease. And this is what we call the waning phases. So let's take a look to see how that happens. All right. So here we have a picture of the Earth and the moon in its different positions around the Earth. And this little green guy, let's pretend that's you taking a look at the moon. We have our sun over here. So we have our light coming in from the right here. And that's why the right side of the moon is always lit up in every single picture here. All right, so the first part is going to be called the new moon. The new moon is when you see no moon in the sky or none of the moon facing us is lit up. And the reason being is this. If this is you looking at the new moon position, you'll notice that the back part of the moon is facing the sun while the other half of the moon, the dark side of the moon, is facing us. As you guys know, when light hits something, it gets reflected or absorbed. So the back part of the moon will get lit up, but this part of the moon is not receiving any light, so we don't see any light. So that's the new moon. However, as the moon continues to revolve around the Earth, and you take a look at the moon at this position, you'll notice that you're going to start to see some of the moon start to light up here. This is where it starts to wax. Okay, We start to get a little bit more light and a little bit less shadow. And this is going to be called your waxing crescent. Easy to remember because light on the right is waxing and it's a crescent shape. And this is the first phase after the new moon. Then the moon is going to continue to revolve. And when you take a look at the moon, again, at this point, you're going to see the right half of the moon lit up and the left half of the moon in shadow. Okay, this isn't called a half moon. So stay away from that. This is actually called a quarter moon. The first quarter moon, sometimes people call it. And the reason why it's called a quarter moon is because in its revolution around the Earth, it's one quarter of the way through. So being that you're able to see half the moon lit up and half in darkness, that's how the moon is going to appear. At this point, when you take a look at the moon, you'll notice that you're going to see a lot more lit up parts of the moon and a lot less dark side of the moon. And this is what we call a gibbous phase, specifically the waxing gibbous phase. Then, as the, we go from the waxing gibbous, where you see more of the light on the right of the moon and a little less shadow, 
we then get to our next position here. And you as the observer looking at the moon will notice that if you take a look at this picture, this whole front half of the moon is all lit up and it's facing you. That is called the full moon, where we see the entire side of the moon all lit up. Now this will conclude our waxing of the moon, going from no light to the new moon, to a little bit of light, to half lit up, to mostly lit up, to completely lit up, that's our waxing phases, the increasing of light. Once we get to the full moon, then we're going to go back to the new moon, which means we're going to go from all lit up to nothing lit up. So we're going to start to wane. So as the observer, again, you take a look at the moon here, you'll notice that you're going to have a lot of light on the left, but the shadows start to creep back on the right here. And this will be your gibbous phase, your waning gibbous. Your gibbous phases are always going to be before and after the full moon. Waxing if there's light on the right, so that's your waxing gibbous, or waning gibbous if the shadows creep in on the right. At this point, again, you're going to be able to see half the moon lit up, so the right half of the moon is going to be dark, and the left half of the moon is going to be lit up. So we call this the third quarter moon, because at this point, the moon is three quarters of the way through its revolution. Okay, and it's the opposite of the quarter moon, so you have to make sure you know the difference. Always go light on the right for the waxing and shadows on the right for the waning. And as the observer, you look over here, you're going to see most of the moon in darkness and then a little bit of light on the left. And this is going to be your waning crescent. So again, your crescents are always going to be before or after the new moon. If there's light on the right, then it's a waxing crescent. If it's all shadow on the right, then it's a waning crescent because you're losing that light. And then we go back to new moon. When you take a look at these phases on diagrams and worksheets or anything else on paper, you're going to see uh, basic renditions of them. So let's take a look at what they look like. A new moon is always going to be a black circle because you're not getting any light there. Waxing crescent. Again, you're going to get that crescent shape with that's usually drawn in white. You have that white coming in on the right, so that means it's waxing. Your quarter moon is going to be when the right half of the moon is lit up in white. And then your waxing gibbous is where you have most of the moon lit up on the right. Then you get your full moon, which will always be a white circle. And then you start to get your waning. So the dark parts of the moon or the shadows are going to start to creep in on the right now. So waning... Gibbous means you have most of the moon lit up, but now the shadows are on the right. Three-quarter moon, the right half of the moon is in darkness, as opposed to the right half of the moon is in light when it's a quarter of the way. So we're losing light here, so it's waning. And then our waning crescent, you get your crescent on the opposite end, and it's getting darker on the right, and we go back to new moon. That's how those phases will be represented when you see them on a test or a worksheet. Now, let's talk about lunar and solar eclipses. When the moon moves around the Earth, we get some of these events called eclipses occurring. Now, as I said before, there's two types. There's a solar eclipse that has to do with the sun, and there's a lunar eclipse that has to do with the moon. So let's take a look at the solar eclipse. If you take a look at the diagram here, you'll notice that the sun is on the right, and the moon is located between the sun and the Earth. So as a result, when the moon is located between the sun and the earth, sometimes it will actually completely block out the sun or it will partially block out the sun. So here's a photograph of a solar eclipse occurring in the early morning and you can see that the moon is actually blocking part of the sun here. All right, during a solar eclipse, what happens is the moon's shadow gets cast on the Earth. A solar eclipse occurs when a total or partial blocking of the sun occurs as the moon passes between the Earth and the sun. So this would kind of be in your new moon position because, again, if you're looking at the moon, you're seeing the dark half of it. Okay, again, you're seeing the dark half of it here. As that moon moves around the Earth and revolves, sometimes... It gets put into a position where the sun's light gets blocked by the earth and the shadow of the earth gets cast upon the moon. And that's called your lunar eclipse. Your lunar eclipse is the movement of the moon behind the earth and into the earth's shadow. When you take a look at the picture here, you'll notice that you have this curved dark area on the surface of the moon. This is actually the earth's shadow being cast on the moon. And because a lot of that light gets blocked out, your longer wavelengths of light, such as the oranges and reds, they are the ones that usually make it 
to the moon and back to Earth, so you get that reddish appearance. Always remember, when you take a look here, your lunar eclipse will be in the full moon position because you're going to be able to see the lit up portion of the moon. So remember, a solar eclipse is when the moon is in between the sun and the Earth, blocking the sun. And your lunar eclipse is when the moon is behind the Earth and the sun. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you found that helpful.